Well, hello, hello, and welcome back to Unapologetically Black Unicorns, or if it's your first time, welcome to Unapologetically Black Unicorns. And as usual, I mean, as per usual, (laughs) I have a wonderful guest who I just met recently. Actually, the person was on a panel that I was moderating at the Inseparable Building Hope Strategy Summit. So another young person, and rather than me do a long bio introduction, I am going to let Alvin Lee introduce himself. So Alvin, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, Hi, all. Uh, It's great to be here. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. Uh, My name is Alvin Hong Lee. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm currently based out of uh, California. Uh, I'm currently a sophomore in college, but I started getting very involved with local community organizing um, when I was a freshman and sophomore in high school, particularly through a local education policy. That was my start into advocacy and policy work. And since then, I've gotten very engaged and active in uh, California is education policy space, both at the state level uh, and local level. And I do a lot of work through an organization called Gen Up, uh, which is a youth-led education advocacy organization focused in California's education space. So when I'm hearing young folks talk about being involved in policy at as freshmen and sophomore in high school, really, I do feel a little schlumpy. I'm going to admit it's like, what was I doing as a freshman in high school? Probably just trying to figure out my way around the hallway. You know what I mean? (laughs) 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 So what got you into it? Like, was there something going on that you, that you were like, wow, we need to change this. We need to, were you in student government? Like talk a little bit about that. Cause I'm, I'm real curious about that. Yeah. When I was uh, growing up, there was a, a, what my best friend, actually, I saw a lot of inequities and lived experiences through. And it was actually through him that I became a lot more aware and cognizant, I think, of these issues from a younger age. And um, because of that, uh, I was actually inspired to go into this community work in high school. And it actually started off with me first going to some local school board meetings. um, And at the board meetings, I ended up um, getting connected with uh, my local teachers union president at the time. And through that, uh, I was kind of roped into more community work. And I started to become a lot more engaged in my local school district and doing a lot more community organizing, not only through through uh, the union, but just through direct engagement with the Board of Education. And uh, it was actually about probably a year after that, sort of the end, middle of sophomore year, that uh, the union president at the time for the Fremont Unified District Teachers Association, I went to Fremont Unified School District uh, in the Bay Area, brought me to a organizing conference at the Berkeley Public Library. And at the time, it was the beginning of the, the Schools and Communities First campaign, which was a split row ballot initiative that was known as Proposition 15 in California on 2020. It was one of the more sort of big, ticket items that was on the ballot uh, for the 2020 election in California. And they were looking for students to to get engaged and organize around this issue. So it was there that I uh, eventually got connected with a lead student organizer that was incredibly active in Oakland Unified at the time. Her name was Lauren. And we ended up linking up, getting coffee, uh, (laughs) and just talking about the lack of youth voice uh, in education governance. Mm -hmm. Um, And out of that, we created Gen Up really as a vehicle to change that. And we began initially with just uh, reaching out to all of the folks in the Bay Area that we had worked with or that we had known, just student leaders that were good friends and allies of ours. Um, And naturally, it kind of just grew larger and larger. And now we have a much more substantial statewide footprint. So that's a bit about uh, sort of how I got my wow. start and how we ended up with Jenna. Wow. Wow. Again, snaps, claps, thumbs up, and a little in awe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I still, now I'm thinking, now what was I doing when I was a sophomore? Still trying to find my way around the hallways. Um, and, you know, probably, probably not that bad. I, I think I don't think I was in student government actually until I was in grad school. I didn't even think about that as a possibility. So when you're doing this work or when you're thinking about sort of, you know, other people who are are young folks, I mean, are these things pretty easy to, to access, to be able to go to a school board meeting or find out about other community organizing events? Or were you guys just lucky that you had somebody who was really 
interested in supporting students to do that, like you're you were talking about the teachers u- union president. Yeah, absolutely. The the best the way I always tell people that want to get engaged, especially in the sort of the organizing space at a local level, which you know is obviously where the most impactful work happens, is it's not a closed space, but it's not a very open space either. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's one of those things where if you make a proactive effort to reach out first, the community is very welcoming with open arms. So I think once you take that initial first step to step out of your comfort zone and make that initial contact, the rest really falls into line. And that sort of was my experience as well. Um, The moment you start becoming engaged and trying to become active in that community, it's a lot more easy to sort of plugged in. So it's not a hard community to break into, but it's also one of those things where it's not like, you know, you're going to be, you know, on your way to school as a student, right? Um, And, you know, there's just openly posted opportunities to to do organizing with certain groups. So I think it's one of those things where you truly have the passion for a particular policy change or making an impact in your local community, absolutely just reach out and go for it because um, it's going to be so rewarding, so impactful, and it'll be so easy to get engaged with your local community. Yeah, that's really, really good advice. I mean, it's not like it's going to be up on the student bulletin board that they're having a teacher's union meeting. I mean, <laughs> that might be in the student lounge. I mean, in the um, in the teacher's lounge, but but not right. in the student bulletin board. And, you know, you're you're talking about you know, going into spaces, and and I'm just going to put it this way. So as young people, you know, you're going into spaces where they're adults, and how intimidating is that? And then the the follow-up question is, I'm just going to shoot a lot of questions at you. I feel it. I feel it right now. But the (laughs) follow-up question is around, um, you know, what is it like when there might not be agreement from the student perspective compared to the teacher's perspective or the administration's perspective? Uh, As a student, it sometimes can be intimidating, but what I've found is that particularly on the issues, or I guess more broadly speaking, all of these issues that we're advocating for ultimately affect us in the most profound way because we're the next generation that's inheriting all of these issues, right? So I say don't feel pressured because we all have an incredible stake um, on the line if we don't do something and engage in these issues on these current discourse. Second, education in particular is a issue I think that students really should have an engaged day say. And the reason is because at the end of the day, the education system was built for us students, right? Their fundamental purpose is to educate us. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, why not hear from the most critical stakeholder or one of the most critical stakeholder in the education systems, the students? I always try to tell uh, the fellow student organizers to remember that, that, you know, you have power in this space and in this room today because you are the direct constituent that this system is built to serve. And so no one knows that experience better than you do. In fact, what the policymakers are trying to do right now is shape that system to better help you, right? So why not just ask you directly and get you as a student directly more engaged? Um, And so I think through that, we found it really empowering for students. Another thing is we found that in education, there's just so much stakeholder noise, right? There's a lot of different interest groups, advocacy groups. I mean, compared to any other issue area, the most money every year is by far poured into education policy, education reform, whether that's through philanthropy, civil society, et cetera. Um, And so a lot of times, a lot of critical things get lost in noise. However, consistent student engagement in education policy is a rare phenomenon. And so when students do speak up, it's very great at cutting through the noise. Mm. A great example is in local school boards, right, at local board meetings. You know, if you get even one or two students to give an open communication or a public comment at a board meeting, the trustees will not only take immediate notice, but they will often take directive and action on what the student gave them put on because it's just so rare to see engaged students. And so if you are able to engage as a student, your voice truly has meaning and has power and it has impact. So that's the first part. Um, And I think the second part is from our work, we've just found that when we see students get engaged in this advocacy at a young age, they feel incredibly empowered. And it, you really see this amazing growth trajectory and this sort of birth of a new sense of leadership. Um, there's been a lot of Janet members that have started their forays into education at an early age, say in ninth grade, by joining the first Janet chapter. And we see that a lot of these same students then 
become the student board member on their local school district. And then they become involved in our statewide work. And now we have students that, you know, started with the general chapter in ninth grade and are now seniors or freshmen in high school that have literally written legislation into law that has been signed by the governor in California. And a lot of these same students are now actually majoring or minoring um, in education. And so perhaps what's even more rewarding and impactful is not only is this youth engagement critical to the systems and policy change in education, but long term, it's cultivating this next generation of education leaders. And arguably, that's even more valuable. Um, a lot of folks like to say that we don't invest in organizations, we invest in people. And I think that's so true, because organizations can disappear, grow or wane all the time, but people, they usually stay. So as long as we're cultivating those leaders, that gives me a lot of faith and hope for our future, particularly our education system. Yeah, yeah, that is, that is really, again, just so powerful to think about, you know, it's, it's not just about going to show up to the meeting, but you're starting to cultivate leaders, um, or, you know, you yourself are being cultivated as a, as a leader, and then somebody who will shape everything that's happening in the future, either directly in the moment or five years later when you're working as a legislator or you're working on a school board or something like that. Right. You know, as you're doing this, this work, you, you, uh, when you were on the panel, you actually were talking about an experience that I think there wasn't an agreement. The students had strong feelings about a policy that needed to change. However, I think the administration was like, like, no, I don't remember if it was the teachers or the administration was like, no, no, that's not going to happen. We're not into it. And you found a way to actually change the minds of the, I believe it was the administrators. Do you, do you know which incident one issue I'm talking about? Yeah, um, it was with um, our local school district at the time in Fremont Unified. We'd been leading this mental health campaign. I mean, our students worked in conjunction with local mental health experts to craft a package costing about $20 million that the district would then fund through the COVID supplemental funding at the time. It was called the Expanded Learning Opportunity Grants in California to invest in these student-created policy solutions to really address mental health in our district. Um, it had been a big pervasive issue in our district that had eluded administrators for a while. Um, there were a string of suicides, more infamously. So it was just kind of a systemic issue that really needed to be addressed um, from a unique policy lens. And so we tried to really tackle that as students. And what ended up happening throughout the process was that there was just a lot of disagreement. And it wasn't even from a particular group in general, but it's just that all the different stakeholders had very strong opinions and very different perspectives on how this could be addressed, right? You had the administrators who believed one thing, uh, the teachers, particularly through the union, who believed that it was other systemic factors, the parents had their own beliefs. And then obviously the student themselves had very strong beliefs as well, right? On what was causing these stressors and what was fostering this uh, difficult mental health ecosystem. And so what actually ended up happening is our resolution was we hosted a series of two very big sort of community town halls. This was during COVID at the time, so they were both virtual. And we invited all the critical stakeholders together, our superintendent, our board of education, our union leaders, our administrators, all the principals from all of the five high schools in our public unified school district. So it was just all of these stakeholders. And we got them together and we brought in students to share their stories and their lived experiences to really set the tone and frame it and show them their urgency and the expedited need for action to really address this issue. And then after that, we just kind of opened it up to a larger discussion where we had all the stakeholders bring a list of five things that they thought the district could implement or execute policy-wise, whether at the school site level, the board of education level, um, or at the district administration level. And we then had all of them share out the had breakout rooms where folks talked individually in smaller groups to really find a consensus. And out of that, we took all of these different policy ideas that were presented by all these different groups, looked at the ones that had the most common intersection, and then framed our solutions under those intersections moving forward. And it still took a lot of work. Um, it was about another eight to nine months of consistent advocacy at school board meetings before the Board of Education finally voted on these measures and actually ended up adopting and implementing it. So it was certainly a struggle, but it was a really enlightening moment for us students because it showed us that this discourse is so critical 
for policy change um, and finding that common ground uh, oftentimes is really important to create that systemic change uh, that we want to see. And usually it might mean that we don't get everything we want, but the bottom line is some action is always better than no action, especially on critical exigencies like mental health who we're talking about, students' lives on the line. And so that was a really great learning moment for us. And um, it was really rewarding at the end of it for all the students that were engaged to see that the fruits of our labor were successful. Wow. Okay, so I have so many questions. <laughs> First of all, this is this is brilliant because you know what I've always thought about mental health advocacy, and, and I would assume this is for any advocacy where there's different stakeholder groups involved, is we all experience that particular issue from our particular lens, right? So if I'm a teacher, or if I'm in the union, or if I'm an administrator or parent or a student. Each of us are going to experience that issue a little bit differently mm-hmm. and possibly think that the way forward um, needs to be from our lens or our frame, right? Mm. So if we're doing it in mental health, it's you know the providers, the administrators, the policy people, the people with lived experience, and their family members. So it's like about five different groups. I'm sure I haven't named them all, but just for the sake of kind of an analogy of what you're talking about. So, you know, providers may be a bit risk averse about something because they have to like carry their um, their malpractice insurance. Mm -hmm. They also have to operate within their scope of practice, which has certain um, boundaries of things that they can or cannot do. And then if you're an administrator, you have to operate maybe from a funding perspective, a policy perspective, a, oh my gosh, the state expects us to do this. Um, as a matter of fact, it's it's written in code that we have to do things a certain way. And if you're a person with lived experience, you're not paying attention to any of those two things that those <laughs> other folks are, right? You're just right. like, no, I want it this way. I need it this way. This is what's really going to help me be, you know, uh, improve. And then family members may also have kind of a different take on it as it may be, um, I want this for my loved one. I want them to be safe. I need them. I need to know where they are. Like lots of those things may come into play. So we're all, we're all talking about the same thing, but Mm -hmm. we all see it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, what, what you've just demonstrated is, you know, how do you bring those different groups together to talk about the things that they would like, each of you would like to see and hear, especially from the students who are going to be the ultimate recipients, right? Yeah. So that you could work a way forward that was a you know, consensus. And in some ways, I guess for some people, it was a bit of a compromise. Maybe for everybody, they had to compromise something. Did you find that as you were listening to the five things that each group brought, that there were things that as students, like, oh, I didn't think about that. Oh, that is interesting. Did you find that at all while you were hearing from the other groups? Oh, absolutely. And I think it really just highlighted the highlighted the complexities and, and nuances of, of, of policy. That's why whenever I, you know, see in the news that, you know, for example, at the federal level, they pass this bill. I'm like, wow. I mean, the amount of, <laughs> the amount of, you know, back and forth it must have taken to just get this through must have been insane. Um, but even at the local level, um, just for example, the Board of Education, right, and the administrators, um, with some of our ideas, they had concerns around student liability. One of our big asks, too, was uh, cultural competency training and professional development training for um, educators. Naturally, the teacher union had some certain concerns. They wanted to know what that would look like and you know whether teachers would be compensated for that time and whether that would be too much of an additional burden on the reg already sort of ridiculous load um, and unpaid labor that teachers have to do outside of school hours. And so there are all these sort of moving parts. There are even concerns from students too, right? I mean, a lot of students felt like these things might might be too performative when they were skeptical that they would actually be effective. Um, from the administrator's perspective, mm-hmm. there, were, there were concerns about how it would be implemented budgetarily, um, whether this would be possible if there was a downturn year and the funding wouldn't be there, right? Now that we've started all these new services and initiatives, how do we make sure they're continually funded? So there are all these moving parts. And what we found too is that just realistically, there's no way we can address all of them. And sometimes what we found is that, you know, you you want to include some 
Um, you might want to push back on others, but at the end of the day, you have to stay focused on sort of the original objectives you presented and make sure that whatever compromise or nuances you add to your original proposal, that the broader aim and the broader policy outcome of whatever you're proposing stays consistent with the original objective you entered this advocacy terrain with. Um, and I think that was a guiding star for us. Hopefully, that was successful. We have yet to see the effects yet of implementing these initi new initiatives, so we'll see, but uh, knocking on wood that it uh, <laughs> stays yeah. true to our original goals. Oh yeah, that's, that's I think, uh, so true, you know, to the same thing for, for mental health is that, you know, when we're doing our advocacy, a lot of times, you know, we want to stay true to, you know, the North Star, the guiding star. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, just thinking back to when we had in California, passed the uh, peer certification legislation. And, you know, sadly, we we did have to make a compromise. And I do say sadly, yet, um, I think, you know, it was either no certification or, or make the compromise. And so on the peer side, we decided to, uh, you know, be okay with the compromises is written and, and know that it, it is written in such a way that it can be revisited. The issue that had to be compromised is, is mm. a can be revisited. So I, I think, you know, <laughs> the, the state is, as the state does, you know, a level of caution of stepping into something they hadn't done before, even though 49 other states had. But however, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, okay, this is this is the way we roll here. So we'll just take this, this one compromise and see how we can move forward. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as you're doing um, your work, how also, um, has it impacted or how do you see it impacting BIPOC and immigrant or first generation communities and other um, folks, especially young people who are put on the margins? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, the, the, the incredible thing about education is education is one of those issues that's fundamental to every single other issue. So when we talk about address, addressing inequities in any other space, uh, racial inequity, economic inequity, all of these things stem from education, even as early as pre-K, starting from three and four-year-olds. And so when we really talk about changing a lot of these other inequities that we see in our society, education is really the key and cornerstone to that, right? Even in health policy, you know, with social determinants of health, education is probably <laughs> one of the greatest social determinants of health outcomes. Mm -hmm. And obviously these impacts uh, desperately, desperately impact uh, communities of color and our BIPOC communities. And so we always have a sharp and critical focus on the equity lens, particularly the racial equity lens when we go about, go about our work. And um, California's education system is a majority minority school system. Um, so about 60 or 55% of our student population uh, identifies Latinx. And so a lot of the work we do is critically affects all of these BIPOC communities. And so we're very cognizant and aware of these um, issues. A lot of student organizers that we have in Gen Up also identifies BIPOC as well as an intersection of identities. And so we really try to be cognizant of all of these issues when we're choosing which advocacy fights um, to take on. One thing that we're particularly proud of is we led the fight in California that implemented ethnic studies as a high school graduation requirement. Um, and this mandate will come into effect full force by the academic year 2029 to 2030. And so this is really cool because, I mean, just having the ability for students to see their own lived experiences to see themselves, their culture, their ancestry, their roots reflected in school curriculum is just so powerful. I mean, representation matters. Um, you know, a lot of people say this and that, but the bottom line is representation freaking matters. Mm -hmm. um, and ethnic studies was just such a fantastic start to that. And I think that's just an example of the ways that education in particular, our work with education advocacy has a strong lens on uplifting BIPOC communities and communities of color. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, I mean, again, you know, speaking my language, I, I always think back to um, growing up, <laughs> what I understood about, you know, my own history was that I came from a country called slave. And I was like, there isn't a country called slave. I'm not a slave. Where Where is that? I don't know where that is. Right. Uh -huh. um, because, you know, that's what we learned about. We didn't learn mm. about Africa or African-Americans. We learned about okay. quote unquote slaves. And mm. I kept thinking, well, I got to come from somewhere that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then in uh, college, when I went to college, you know, undergrad much later, I minored in um, African-American studies and it was mind blowing. It was really, of course, you know, by this point, of course, I understood more, 
um, understanding our history. My parents made sure we understood our history. We had all these games because we moved around the, the world, of course, me growing up. So we had like, you know, the Black History Mystery Game. I still remember that game. It was like, it was the way that my parents were like, okay, you're not going to get this in school, but you are going to get it at home. Mm. We had these... Um, these comic books called Golden Legacy. They were my brother's first and then they were handed down to me, um, uh -huh. but they're called Golden Legacy Comics. And each comic or graphic novel, but they were really comics for kids, told uh -huh. the story of an important um, African-American person. Could be, mm -hmm. um, there was Harriet Tubman, there was MLK, there was um, Alexander Dumas. There was like all these different ones. And I, I still have them. You know, it was my parents' attempt to make sure that we saw ourselves. When in school or in curriculum, we may not have seen ourselves, especially traveling. Mm -hmm. But it also harkens to the fact that you know, what did they do with enslaved folks is they didn't give them an education. And so, mm -hmm. you know, or what did they do with Native folks here in the Americas is um, there wasn't, you know, they would rip them from their culture, their language, take everything away from them and put them in boarding schools where they would control how much education they would get. So I think you're exactly right that, you know, education is one of the greatest social determinant of health factors. Otherwise, why would people control it in such a way, right? Right. You know, I couldn't agree more about how representation matters in um, curriculum. And, you know, so proud that you got that past the um, ethnic studies for 2029, 2030, which feels like it's a gazillion years away, but <laughs> that means they're going to build a curriculum that is actually good and, and researched and effective and all of that. So I think that's great. Have you all been looking at, um, in California, we did have youth mental health legislation. Were you, were you involved in any of that work? Yeah, we did some work with, um, I, actually inseparable to advocacy in California. Um, I remember Senate Bill 224 with uh, Senator Portentino in California that mm -hmm. added mental health literacy into health education curriculum in California. So um, mm -hmm. we, we, we definitely have, yeah. Awesome. And then um, lastly, um, when you're Doing your work, and this is just something I'm I'm curious about too, because you know there there are times when, and I can think of you know when my mom was uh, this was years ago, she was, she was in a coma and we had to in hospital and we had to advocate for you know first of all getting accurate information and then because people are afraid to tell you that you know your loved one is in a coma, well mm. they're not afraid to tell you that they're afraid to tell you what level. I right. think they don't want you to lose hope or they don't want you to worry. I don't know. But, you know, we really had to, to, to advocate to get the right information and advocate for her care and her needs. And one of the things that one of my family members was afraid of was, you know, be careful about how far you push because the nurses or the doctors or the administration may not take a, as good a care of your loved one, which was <laughs> like wow, wow, that is like seriously deep. You're trying to do the right thing and then the hospital is going to turn and kind of like not be as attentive or whatever. I mean, it, was there any fear from your parents, for example, or any of your family members? Or have you heard this from other students, family members, fears about doing advocacy, you know, either, you know, in high school or college? Um, yeah, I mean, it's for me personally, you know, we've never had those family concerns, fortunately. But uh, for example, you know, last year uh, on our health slate, we did a lot of ad advocacy around uh, vaccine and self-consent to vaccine. Um, and there's one particular bill, um, Senate Bill 866, that our students were helping lead the charge on. And uh, they actually got particular heat for that. There were people that were um, giving um, kind of violent threats on their Twitter profile. They were you know, mm -hmm. calling into to community hearings and public comments and essentially just um, excuse my French, but shitting on the students and saying very inappropriate things and just uh, really out of line to be attacking student leaders like that. Um, so it mm -hmm. certainly happens. And I think that's just sort of the nature of the work. <laughs> you know, the thing with free speech is it's such a blessing, yeah. but you know, at the same time, it can, uh, as we've seen with recent events in <laughs> yes. American yes. politics, it can be very much quickly used in the wrong ways as well. Well, I'm glad that number one, you know, that there are other students, especially through through Gen Up, that you have other people around you who can help you with any feelings that you're having around those things, or, you know, if you feel gaslit or anything like that, I'm, I'm uh, 
guessing having a peer group can be super helpful with all of that. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You're not on your own. So let me ask you something. So Gen, Gen Up, is it only California or is it national? Um, and how do people get involved if they want to be involved as a, as a student? Yeah. Um, our work is primarily focused in California, but we are trying to build a more national footprint, particularly in state education policy in other states. But again, folk, our work is focused in California. If students want to get involved, they can visit our website um, at generationup.net. And in the top right-hand corner of the website, there should be a tab that says uh, join today. And that will link to a form uh, that you simply submit. And then our organizing team will take it from there. If your district falls into a place where a, an existing Gen Up chapter already exists, uh, we'll connect you with that existing chapter. And if there isn't, and there's interest uh, from you as a student, our organizing team will work with you to start a new Gen Up chapter and bring uh, student advocacy and education to that local school district. Fantastic. So you have dropped mad wisdom as everybody does throughout the you whole too. podcast, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, this this is the time where I ask people, you know, to do that one last bit of wisdom dropping before we sign off. So is there, you know, any one last bit of wisdom that you would like to share with folks? Mm, I think that just have grit and have passion, in whatever you do. That's probably the most defining characteristic that I've seen from, you know, for example, successful advocacy campaigns and movements versus non-successful ones or folks that just have that grit and that genuine passion and desire to make a positive change in their communities. And I truly believe that everyone has that desire and and a will and, and drive to make a positive impact in their communities. And it's about harnessing that drive and turning it and procreating that into positive impact. And so I guess, you know, if I could ask folks to do anything, it would be, you know, bring out that gritty side of you, go out and do something for your local community, whether that's mutual aid, whether that's, you know, direct nonprofit services, whether that's policy work, whether that's advocacy, no matter what it is, there's so many problems in our society and in the U.S. and in your local communities that need solving. Uh, and frankly, it can only be done if it's a collective effort from everyone. And so I think that collective action is so critical. And I truly believe in everyone's individual power to make that change. So just go out there, do something for your community and do service, whatever that may be, uh, because I promise you the world will be a much better place uh, if you engage with it. Snap, snap, clap, clap, thumbs up. If I had four thumbs, I'd put them all up. So thumbs and toes, I don't know. But that was amazing, amazing. Thank you, Alvin, for joining me today on Unapologetically Black Unicorns. Thank you so much for having me. And to our listeners, y'all know the drill. Subscribe, like, do any of that you want. But the most important thing that I would ask that you do is to please share the podcast with others. Folks are sharing just amazing, amazing information and wisdom and such examples, as we say, representation matters. So please do share. And until next week, we'll see you on Unapologetically Black Unicorns. <laughs> <laughs>